All right, well, it's really good to be here. It's good to see all of you and to be back here once again. I'd like us to look at a couple of people tonight. And I guess if I give this a title, I would say little known folks that made a big difference. I'd like you to take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 18. Again, my name's Adam Fenske. Yes, I'm a father of 10 kids. And uh, it is a blessing. Uh, I've said many times, my wife came from a family of six. I came from a family of six. I was the oldest. She was the second oldest. And if you'd have told me when we were married that we'd be in this place today, I don't know how you felt about it either. You have 10, right? 11. All right, so he has me beat. That's one of them. <laughs> Cheaper by the dozen, they sell. Uh, all right. <clears throat> but anyway, you know, it's a real, uh, it's a real thrill to see your uh, just... We were, we were driving down the road just today, and I guess you really get used to seeing everybody together as a family, and when just one person isn't there, something's just not right. It's amazing how that is, you know, how much the Lord changes your family with each child that comes into it. You don't really think about that before, but when they're just not there, it's a whole lot different. You know, their personalities, everything that they contribute, their perspectives, uh, I only have two girls. Uh, brother, <laughs> Pastor Beckford said something about eight boys and two girls, and I told Pastor Kelly I'm glad it's not the other way around. <laughs> uh, I think my sons would be happier that it's not that way. But anyway, uh, you know, it's amazing to see just how each thing in life the Lord gives you, and he does not give you above that you are able, okay? We, um, we've really been blessed. And uh, the... And not just with children, but just to see how the Lord's changed our perspective about a lot of things, you know, um, partly because of the kids. But just looking back over the years, I really had never an intent to serve the Lord. I didn't want to be in the ministry at all. My dad was a deacon in our church. He was the treasurer for many years. And uh, we went through some things when I was about 13, 14 years old. We had a huge church split. And it was pretty nasty. Those things can really be a problem. I guess. And I got very, very bitter and hard-hearted toward the Lord. The rest of my teen years, I wish, I was telling my boys the other day, I wish I could cut that part out of my life and throw it away. Sin I got into, things that I did, things that I said, and uh, just the way I lived. I could, you know, I guess we still went to church, and I looked good on the outside, and on the inside I was rotten. And, uh, actually went to Bible college, believe it or not, of all things, I was a rebellious person on the inside. And really, I, you know, I'd gotten saved as a young boy. I'd just never really gotten discipled. There were a lot of things that I did not know, didn't understand. To me, Christianity was just being faithful to church. And um, I wanted to be in business, but at the same time, <laughs> I wanted to go to Bible college so that when I had a bad pastor, I know enough Bible to boot him right out of that church. And I, I told that to Dr. Childs when I got there. He was our academic dean. He asked me. I walked into his office for registration. Uh, uh huh. He was, really, in a lot of ways. And he looked at me and he said, he was just a short, little, bald headed man with a little bit of fuzz on top. And I, I had heard about him, but I didn't know him. And he looked at me over his glasses, and he said, what you here for, kid? And I thought, oh. so I told him. <laughs> I don't know what he thought, but anyway. <laughs> he persuaded me, and I, I was just being honest. I, wasn't, I, I didn't see myself as being proud or hard-hearted toward the things of the Lord. Uh, hey, I was at Bible college. You know, it was amazing how from that moment, he asked me, he said, why would you only do, I wanted a one-year program. He said, why would you waste your time and just doing one year? You know what you really should do? Sign up for our three-year program. You would get grammar. You'd get composition. Uh, where do you want to go after this? I told him. Uh, I wanted at the time I was going to go to Pensacola Christian College. He said, oh, our teacher's a Pensacola graduate. They might let those credits transfer. Boy, if you signed up for our three-year program... <laughs> And he twisted my arm, and I took it hook, line, and sinker. Next thing I know, I was there for four years. 
and I met my wife there. God brought us together. And my second going, yeah, at the end of my second year, I gave my life to the Lord. What a difference. I confessed all my bitterness. I got rid of all that trash and garbage that I'd been carrying. And at that point, especially my junior year, uh, <clears throat> David Cummins, you remember him. He's not with the Lord, actually, just recently, but I had a class with him, and he began to talk about the Holy Spirit and him working in our lives and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how he directs. And it was a small class, maybe six people. What a class. This man was in his mid-70s. He pastored for many years. And God used that semester to burden my heart to serve him in a ministry. And, you know, I look back and I say, Poof. you know, I, it's amazing to see how God can just change your perspective on everything through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And then as we submit and take those little steps, how far God can bring you through. You know, I'm not saying that I've gone very far, but he's built my faith and he's taught me a lot of lessons. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to look back and see the things that God's been able to do in my life, in my wife's life. Um, and then now my family. And uh, it's a real blessing. Acts chapter 18. Uh, we uh, also wanted to say we really appreciate your prayers. I know a lot of you have expressed uh, that you've been praying for my father-in-law. We really appreciate that. You know, there's a lot of uh, just a lot of unknowns. We don't know how it's going to go, but we do know who's in control and whose plan it is that it will go according to. You know, the the uh, we were talking to a uh, specialist it was two weeks ago. He'd been on the ventilator for a week, and they said due to his medical thing with the uh, liver and kidney transplant he had four and a half years ago, we didn't expect him to make it this long. I don't know how he's still alive. And I looked right at him, and I said, I do. It's God. And I was able to share a little bit with him. And at that point, he, he kept, well, I guess if God is doing this, and it was just kind of neat to, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think in his mind... It's not going to work out, but, you know, everything that we've seen, we know God has his hand in it. Uh, his liver and kidney have not failed. They expect that, that to happen because, obviously, your lungs aren't working correctly. Lack of oxygen, your organs are going to start failing. That hasn't happened. Three weeks, he's been on that today. And uh, uh, there's been pressure to start pulling plugs and turning switches off and all those things, but... That's not in our hands. And the Lord has kept him alive, and we're praying. Very soon he's going to walk down that hallway and leave that place. That would be my hope. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> if the Lord takes him home, what better place for a Christian? What better place to be with the Lord? To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. How could we ever complain about that? And so uh, it's harder for those that are left behind I guess we just see things in our human perspective, but what a joy it is to serve the Lord and to be able to search the scriptures and find answers to all of your problems. And uh, the Psalms have been a very special place to us recently. Now I'm starting to ramble. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. But God is so good. I, I just have uh, my wife and I... Um, uh, in-laws, we've all been learning so much about the Lord, uh, seeing him reassure. You know, it's, it's amazing, you know, a lot of these things you know, and then now God's taking it to another level, and you have to take steps. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for all he's done so far. Acts chapter 18. I want to talk about two people here that are little-known folks, but they made a big difference. You know, there's a lot of people all through history that we'll never know their name, we'll never know anything that they really accomplished. I think of our military. Many men have gotten things called the Medal of Honor for acts that were above and beyond what were what, these actions that were above and beyond what was expected or what was required of a man to give. Many of those uh, were boys who... Uh, sacrifice things or sacrifice their life leaping on a grenade and taking the impact, saving their platoon. 
you know, it, various different instances we could go through history. Their names, many of them, we don't know. They're not a household name, but they had a huge impact in what they did, what they were accomplished. Two people that we find mentioned six times total in the scriptures is a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And I'd like us to just do a little study on them tonight. Not all of this is original with me. I've picked up a lot of things over the years from different men, and uh, I've never preached this, so bear with me. There might be some things that are awkward. But this couple is mentioned six times in Scripture. Three times we find them here in the book of Acts, one time in Romans chapter 16, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and then lastly in 2 Timothy chapter 4. God mentions uh, almost, I believe, every time uh, you can search this for yourself, like the Bereans, to find out if these things are so. But I believe every time they are mentioned as a couple. It's, it's kind of interesting how the Lord does that. Let's start in verse 1. We'll read the first three verses here. Now, this is Paul. This is the narrative of Paul. This is his second missionary journey. And he has just come from Athens. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. We're going to look at four things this evening, Lord willing. And uh, I believe that if all of us were to apply these four characteristics that we find here in what's told us of Aquila and Priscilla, if we were to apply these characteristics in our life, um, rather, maybe I should say, if we were to recognize them and allow the Holy Spirit to put those things into our life, then I believe we could really be used of God as they were as well. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we're going to be, look at the first thing here. Thank you again, Lord, for these men. Thank you for this sweet time that we can be together around your word, having fellowship also one with each other. Thank you for Pastor Bickford and the folks here at Lee and the uh, willingness that they have to put these retreats on and the encouragement that they are. Lord, there will be fruit born from these retreats that will matter throughout all eternity. Decisions made, people encouraged to walk with you. We just pray that you would continue to strengthen, meet needs. Lord, we're needy people. You know all of our hearts in this room. And I pray that all of us tonight, as we take time and look in your word, would be encouraged and challenged in these areas we're going to look at. Father, I ask that you guide my thoughts, guide my words, and that your Holy Spirit would do his work in our hearts. We ask this in your name. Amen. So the first thing I'd like us to look at, it mentions that they were here in this location in Corinth, that Paul comes alongside them, and he wrought, it says, with them. The word wrought really means to do work or to do manual labor. Uh, if you think about our country today, we see it especially with all of these uh, different circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, there's not too many people that are really willing to do manual labor anymore. Uh, it's more, uh, some in my family even, uh, not my immediate family, but extended family, uh, friends, people that I know in town back in Stratton, are more content to st sit at home and collect a check than to work. Uh, I work in a sawmill, and one of the managers mentioned at the end of the year how grateful he was to each of the employees because they continued working. And I, a lot of us, we're fathers, we're husbands, we have families, we have mortgages, we have car payments. There's needs, okay? And I guess to a lot of us, we just shrugged our shoulders and we thought, well, why wouldn't we? But that mindset has largely been changed in our country, and it's on purpose. See, these things are designed. People are being, anyway, manipulated to, uh, I don't want to get it political, but anyway, 
has made me nervous. You spoke negatively of uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer a little bit ago. <laughs> Wasn't sure I was in the right company here. But uh, I just, uh, anyway, I, you know, a lot of that mindset, though, has crept into our churches. Almost you could call it a welfare Christianity where we believe we're entitled to certain things. We believe that we deserve. And instead of coming to God with an attitude of, Lord, would you use me? Instead of having that attitude, a lot of times we're like, Lord, what are you going to do for me? What, what, what position can I fill? What place can I find in this ministry that would make me look good? Or that would give me something as a status symbol, <laughs> I guess. We had a lady just recently leave our church. Uh, and one of, those, one of the reasons, she'd, she'd been a member for over 20 years. Uh, she was older. She had been a public school teacher for many years also. But she, she said we were too, uh, too Trump. And I, I, <laughs> that, to my pastor, okay, my father-in-law, he liked his policies, but he did not like the man. So that was really a slap, <laughs> that was really a slap in the face. I, I got a kick out of that when he tried to explain that one. But uh, anyway, I, I laughed. But the main reason, one of the main reasons that she left was that she had never been asked to teach a Sunday school class. And that had bothered her for over 20 years. Now, she didn't even come faithfully, but that was something that she was really bugged about. And I, she'd never expressed that to anybody, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, I guess that just, that just kind of blew my mind when she, when she shared that because I thought in my heart, I, I have a Sunday school class. That's not a authoritative position. It's not a position of honor. Right? You know, to me, it's a blessing. It's a place to serve. It's a place to put my hands into the Word of God and be able to think about what the Bible says. So that what, what do I do with that? I'm sharing it with somebody else. And Paul rolled out. Now, we're talking here in the physical realm. He's trying to provide for himself as he's here in Corinth. But these folks were by occupation. They were tent makers. Aquila, Priscilla, Paul joins and comes right alongside. And they roll up their sleeves and go to work. God is a worker when you think about it. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship. God is a worker. And he's working on us now to conform us to the image of his son. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 23 tells us that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Really, that if we had that, if we applied that verse in all areas of our life, that would change a lot of our things. How many things do we do because we're afraid of what somebody else is going to think of us? The fear of man. Bringeth a snare, Proverbs 29, 25, I believe it is, says. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And if my eyes are fixed and my mind is fixed on, oh, what's the boss going to say? I need to take that overtime. because I know it's during church, but I got to take the overtime because I don't want the boss to think negatively, negatively of me. There was a man who came to our church, and he shared with me what God had just done in his life. They were just passing through. He worked. Uh, he graduated from the University of Maine, had an engineering degree. He's very successful. The company he worked for had two lines of manufacturing, and he was over both of them. He was very successful. Um, he was born again, and he was very faithful in his church also. Anyway, uh, as he was sharing this, he said his boss came to him. And he said, we're going to open a third line of production. I would like you to oversee this third line. I don't know what the product was, but he said, I could not do that as a Christian. The Bible spoke specifically that I could not have my hands in this. He said, I, I went to my boss and I said, I can't. And, and he explained why. His boss offered him $10,000 as a bonus if he would do it. He said, boy, I, I, honestly, I can tell you. I sat there for a minute thinking about it, but then I said, no, I can't. 
He put in his two weeks notice. He had to move his family to another location. He found another job. He was still in engineering, but he was at a much less pay level um, and really didn't have as much responsibility as he had before. Uh, he still worked hard. He had a 90-day review that came, and the, uh, the owner of the company called him in, and he said, yeah, uh, I need to speak to you. And this man's thinking, oh, this is going to be my review, but it's different that this would be the owner and not my immediate supervisor. And he said, uh, your boss just quit. I have been watching you, and I'm really impressed with what you're doing. We're going to uh, promote you to fill his position. You're also going to be taking over these other positions as well. And he said, this will be your salary. He said, I kid you not, to the dime, it was what I made before plus the $10,000. He said, I, I, I was blown away. I walked out of that just stunned that God would do that in my life. He said, you know, when we, you know, and he had a message. Oh, boy, that man had a testimony. It made him fervent to serve the Lord now because he'd seen God work. Anyway, Paul wrought with them. He was willing to work. He was willing to labor by putting the Lord first also. But Ephesians chapter 6 refers to how our relationship should be to our bosses. Yes, we submit ourselves to them. Uh, but then he also adds in some phrases. He says, as unto Christ. And then in verse 8, as unto the Lord. You know, we know as believers that whatsoever you eat or drink or, or whatsoever we do, I misquoted that somewhere, we are to do all to the glory of God. Every aspect of our life. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul was speaking to the uh, uh, church at Thessalonica about how he had labored with them while he had been there. And he said, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. He didn't rely on other people to meet his needs. He was a worker. He was somebody that was diligent. Titus tells us in many places, it speaks of our good works in all three chapters of Titus, but in chat, Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, it gives us the admonition that in all things, showing thyself a pattern unto good works. Every local church needs workers. You know, you want to give your pastor the blessing of his ministry. Maybe you give him a heart attack doing it too. Come up to your pastor and say, Pastor, is there anything that I can do to help? Not expecting a deacon's position or a Sunday school teacher or a, not expecting anything like that, but just is there anything that I can do to help? I think that would really be a blessing if, most, if more of us in our churches would have that attitude. I think every pastor that's in here would say, yes, I would love to have that. It seems... It, that that would be the case. Because naturally, we don't want to do that. We're wrapped up with our own things. So not only were they a hardworking or an industrious couple, but they were also an itinerant couple. The word itinerant speaks of somebody that would move from place to place. You know, have you ever thought about how, um, well, let's, let's look at the passage. In verse 18 of chapter 18, it says, And Paul tarried after this there yet a good while. Then he took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. Verse 19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. Who is the them? Priscilla and Aquila. So he left them in Ephesus. Let's see. Go back over to verse 2. There are a lot of locations here. We see in verse 2 that he had come from Rome, Italy, until they had been cast out because they were Jews. He was born in Pontus. Pontus is, was a location in northern Syria. Uh, Paul met them in Corinth. So if you begin to think about the Mediterranean and all these places, these folks have bounced around an awful lot. From Syria, they've gone to Italy, they've gone to Ephesus, they're in Corinth, well, they go to Ephesus after they were in Corinth, but they're just all over the place. 
In verse 18, we just read it. They left Corinth with Paul. They traveled to Ephesus. In Romans chapter 16, we find that they are back in Rome. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing, obviously, to Timothy, but he tells him to greet Aquila and Priscilla. They were there with him in Ephesus. Timothy was their pastor. Uh, but their view, I believe, or Aquila's perspective was that he would go anywhere that God led him. If God led him and gave him the direction, he was going to be available and he was going to be obedient and go anywhere that he could be a blessing if it required traveling place to place. You see, this world is not our home. We get attached to this world because it's tangible. It's something we can see and glimpse and hold on to. But really, our eternal home is in heaven. And the things we're doing here on earth right now need to be done with the mindset that we're not citizens here. And I love my country. I love the United States of America. I love many things about our nation. But especially in this past 18, 24 months, I've had to remind myself, this is not my country. That's hard. Because I love, you know, I'm very patriotic and I love this place. I love, oh man, you want to make me tear up? You start singing the Star Spangled Banner. That just goosebumps me, okay? <laughs> Let me say this right. You sing the Star Spangled Banner as it was meant to be sung. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. <clears throat> oh man, I can't believe these people that make so much money by slaughtering a song. And, uh, but anyway, you know, that, that, I, I, I love my nation. But my nation is not my home. This world is not my home. As the old song says, I'm just a passing through. Okay? The, you know, even Abram, his, he, was, he was looking toward the city whose builder and maker was God. And he was doing that by faith. And that's how you and I are supposed to be living as well. We, don't make, we ought not to be making our decisions based off of our own personal desires or our plans. How about your family ties or family roots? I came from southeast Minnesota. I was a Minnesota Vikings fan. Mm, don't even start that. But I was also a Minnesota Twins fan, and that was where I was in my life when I went to Bible college. <laughs> but, uh, I was so messed up. But anyway, sports were everything to me. I loved, I loved baseball especially, and uh, <laughs> I had every intention of, from, especially when I got to North Carolina, it might not have been this way, but I, I went to North Carolina, and uh, the first time I went to Walmart, I couldn't understand a word they said over the intercom. They, and my dad was there, my mom was there, and we, I remember standing in the aisle listening. Did you get that? No? I mean, I remember checking out. The lady told us the, t the total, and we just all three looked at each other. She spun the little thing around so we could see how much we had to pay her. I, didn't, I couldn't understand it. Uh, it drove me crazy. They were different down there. And the more different I realized they were, the more I didn't like it. Then I met my wife. <laughs> Everything changed. You know, in Minnesota, we say, the roof is leaking. Now, I've been trained in 14 years of marriage. It's not a roof. It's a roof. I still ask her which one she means. You want me to get a pen? Is that a pen or a pen? And she says, oh, you know, those small ones. <laughs> that doesn't work, honey. That doesn't work. You want a pin or a pin? That's how she says it. It drives me crazy. But anyway, but my roots were there. And that's, but God had to uproot me. And again, he, he, you know, it, when we are trusting the Lord and we're taking the steps that the Lord puts in front of us to take, it could be that God moves you to a different location. How many of us in this room are from Maine originally? All right, probably half. Well, you guys are all from Maine. You're in North Carolina. But yeah, and all of us, though, at some point in our time, probably have moved. Okay? God desires that we would be a vessel 
that he can do anything with us. Isn't it amazing how God has chosen something like man to do his work through that? God could have done so many other <laughs> I, I, I'm not God, thankfully, but th I, you know, I think in my mind, why would you choose something that is like man and then even give him a choice about whether or not he wants to do it? in order to get your will done or your work accomplished. But God's looking for men who are desiring to be an empty vessel, yielded to God, a clean vessel, that God can take and accomplish his work through them. Remember Hudson Taylor, I'm not going to quote it correctly. Hudson Taylor was um, used mightily of the Lord, and he had a diary in which he wrote something to the effect of, I used to ask God if I could help him. And I began to ask God if he could help me. So I ended up asking God if he would do his work through me. See, he had to get out of the way and surrender and give God all of his life before God could really use him. But Aquila and Priscilla, I believe, wanted to be willing to serve with a pastor, to take their bur his burdens from him. Uh, we find, and we'll look at it in a minute, we find two different times that the church at the location they were in was actually in their house. These folks wanted to serve God. We don't ever find that he was a pastor. We don't even know when the man got saved. There's a lot of things we don't know about them, but what we do know is they had a heart to be used of God. They were... Hardworking, they were industrious, they were itinerant, willing that God would move them anywhere that they could be a blessing. Let's look toward the end of this chapter. If you would go down to verse 24 there in Acts 18. Something else that we see here is they were also an instructing couple. An instructing couple. Acts chapter 18, verse 24. We're going to read down through verse 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So Paul, and, or, uh, uh, Paul has already left. He's gone on. Aquila and Priscilla are still here. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he began, uh, excuse me, he, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now this man loved the Lord he desired to serve the Lord, and he was giving it all he had, but there was something missing. What was missing? Christ. Christ. Now, well, let's see here. Verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogues. I, you know, I, there are a lot of things here about Apollos. He was uh, instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in the spirit. He taught diligently. There's some good characteristics about this man. Very zealous for the work of the Lord. Very zealous. He, he had boldness. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They were an instructing couple. They were willing to give instruction. You know, giving instruction to somebody who thinks that they're right is probably one of the hardest things to do. It's hard to change somebody's mind when they think they're right. What would you think of as being, well, there's a couple things here, but what, what, is, a, what, is, a, what is really necessary? Uh, what would you say would be very, very, very essential, very necessary for me if I was going to approach you about something? Huh? Information, yes. That is one of them. Absolutely. Can you teach somebody if you've not been taught? You can try. <laughs> we have a lot of different machinery in the sawmill I work in. We have a lot of people who aren't good at what they do, teaching people how to do their job. Drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a perfectionist in some of those ways. We have a... Uh, um, that's, that's not important. But you have to be instructed before you can instruct. You know, if I worked for Corey, and Corey dropped me off, yeah, you can laugh. <laughs> I won't be offended because I laugh thinking about it too. But if, I, 
if I work for Corey, and let's say that Corey on the first day of work, you know, I, I, he says, all right, I'm going to drop you off at this location. I need you to put the trusses up, get the sheathing on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, I'd know the materials he's talking about, but do you think I'd know how to do it? Probably not in the way that he expects it to be done. What wouldn't be necessary for me to do the job right is I, I needed Corey or somebody to come alongside and show me, right? Now, let's say that I do it, and that's how he does it with me. Now I'm equipped to show the next guy how to do it. You see, the passing on of information, the, the, the giving of information is so necessary. Proverbs chapter 15, 32 and 33 says, He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. You know, there are a lot of people that you try to help and they say, I know, I, and I, I know, I know. I've seen people like that. Have you ever been like that? Yeah, I have. I have. And what's at the root of that? It's pride. Pride. And they did. really, when we refuse that instruction, we're despising our own soul. We're harming ourselves. Instruction is necessary, but also humility. He that heareth reproof getteth understanding. Verse 33 of Proverbs 15 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. You know, instruction is necessary if I'm going to instruct somebody, but also humility is necessary too. If I come to you in a proud way, we're going to clash. How much information is really going to be soaked up on your end? Not much. Not much. Only by pride cometh contention. The opposite of pride is humility. If I came to you in a humble way or you came to me in a humble way and we had a conversation about how one of us was wrong, that humility would take that conversation a whole lot farther, wouldn't it? They were an instructing couple. Look at verse 11 here. Paul had taught in Corinth a year and six months. Um, what I'm talking about here is how Aquila and Priscilla had been instructed. It says that he continued there a year and six months, uh, months teaching the word of God among them. For, uh, for 18 months, Aquila and Priscilla had sat at the feet of the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine being discipled by Paul? And the, the wisdom and the, the oh, just the, oh, just the, uh, that, that, that is one of my f most favorite things. And I've thought of that. And I've told my wife this many times about the pastor's retreat. Or the, <laughs> not the past, the men's retreat. I'll get that right. There are many pastors in here. And different times over the years that I've been here for a men's retreat, uh, you know, my father-in-law was here too, there would be a conversation taking place between those pastors. I loved listening to those conversations. There was wisdom there. They were sharing things about the Bible, bouncing it off of each other, or sharing what God was doing in their life. I love that. It, and and I, I think of how Aquila and Priscilla, listening to Paul, being discipled by Paul for 18 months, hearing him expound on the scriptures. These folks had been instructed. There was discipleship that had taken place in their life. And they were equipped now when they heard Apollos, and I can imagine as they're sitting there in the synagogue listening to Apollos, they saw his zeal, they saw his, his spirit, but they knew something just wasn't right. They knew because they'd already been taught. And I believe in an attitude of humility, they came to Apollos and were able, as it says, to expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. More perfectly. They were able to do that because they had been taught. They had already been stepping in the direction that he needed to go. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 and 25. You can turn there if you would, please. I know I've been reading a lot of verses. We'll try to look some of these up just to keep you awake a little bit. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
and verse 24 and 25. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God will peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The servant of the Lord must be apt to teach. Apt to teach. Also, something else here is uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. He said, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You know, you think in your life, men or women, that God has brought into your life that changed you. They took time and invested in you. Now, the first people you would probably think of would maybe be your parents or grandparents or some relative, somebody that God allowed to come into your life and it helped shape you and set you in a direction. But, you know, you think about it spiritually. <sighs> Different people that God has brought into your life, people that you got counsel from, people that took time to sit with you and disciple you, mentor you, think, uh, help you think the way that the Word of God uh, would have you to think. I'm very grateful. There are a lot of men that I can think of. One would be... Uh, David Mulvane. He was a pastor that came into our church, and he began to help me. I didn't want to be helped. He began to ask me if I'd read my Bible that week. I hadn't. But he was asking me. He was helping me. And, and everything he began to do in our relationship, he was always pushing me to give my life to the Lord. Not pushing, but leading me, helping me to see my need for the Lord. Think of men like Dr. Childs, David Cummins, I already mentioned, Frank Camp. He was a teacher I had. I didn't like him. He had a southern way that was a little hillbilly, but the first time I sat down and talked to him, I was apologizing for something that I hadn't done right. And <laughs> I thought for sure he was going to really let me have it. He began to cry, and he stood up and came around that desk and gave me a hug and prayed with me and thanked me for what I'd said. That took me back. That was not, the that was not how I thought that conversation was going to go. But he was tender toward me. He desired that I would walk with God and grow. And what he saw was the Lord working in my life. And he tried to work with that and develop that and encourage that, that I would continue to be submitted to God. Bruce Townsend. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is... Uh... My father-in-law, we didn't always get along in that relationship. <laughs> I mean, it was a little funny sometimes because I was married to his daughter, and uh, he was always very respectful of me, though, and I didn't always understand him, I guess is the way to put it. But he was also my pastor. He allowed me to come alongside and serve with him and grow together, grow in the Lord and learning our, um, our purpose that God had for us. He became a friend. And uh, I guess in the uh, past, <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. <clears throat> in the past four years or so, anytime I had a question, day or night, he was there. Why? He cared. He mentored me. He helped me. He wanted me to grow. He challenged me when I was wrong. I appreciate that. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life, or reproofs of correction are the way of life. I, I have grown to appreciate his reproof. He would see something I wasn't doing right, or I'd say something in a, not in the right way even. And he would reprove me. I appreciate that. 
He shared his heart. Like I said, we became friends. It was much more than just working together. There was a personal relationship there. And I, he let me watch his walk with God and grow and be encouraged in that. And I appreciate that. But there are people that come into our life that God allows, and we need to be thankful for those folks that are trying to disciple us, trying to be used of God to help us. And I think of our pastors and how often we look at our pastors, we take them for granted. We don't think about what God is trying to do through them. We don't thank the Lord for them. We don't pray for them, that God would give them wisdom. You know, the pastoring is a very thankless job on this earth, I think. It's a very lonely job in many times. And uh, these are things I'm learning as I'm seeing, you know, over the years. And uh, but I'm thankful for my pastor because he loves the Lord more than he loves the acclamations of man, the praise of man. And we need to seek godly counsel. Anyway, so verse 27, they took Apollos aside. They expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. What time am I supposed to be done, gentlemen? I've... Free time at 8.30. You have five minutes. Here we go. All right. They'd taken him aside and they were expounding the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Why could they write ahead and exhort the disciples? It's because they, know, they knew he had been taught the whole thing. They had taken him aside. I, maybe Aquila was on that. I don't know. I don't want to use the word committee. Our churches have enough committees. But the, uh, these brethren, they wrote, exhorting the disciples in the location he was headed, that they would receive him and allow him to do what God had. And, and I was just thinking about that. The reason was now that he was now instructed. He'd gotten the whole thing. His Zeal was still there. His diligence was still there. That desire to serve the Lord was still there. But now he'd been, his, his view of the scriptures and of Christ had, expound, had been expounded to him and had changed. Now he had the whole picture. And so verse 27, let's see here. They exhorted the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. How could he do that? Because a little known couple had in a humble way come alongside him and taken him to themselves, and they had expounded what he didn't know. This man was being able to be mightily used, it says, among the Jews. He was able to convince them that Jesus Christ was the Christ. And that was possible because two people. You think about that too. Even Priscilla was used. I think there's a place where women can be used of God. I appreciate godly women who know the scriptures. Uh, I appreciate my wife. There are many, many conversations she and I have together over things, especially the Bible that God has taught her something, and she encourages me because of what God's taught her. She sees things maybe a little bit differently, and we'll talk about it, talk about it, and boy, there's a lot of times where she's right. And I'm glad because she is being used to help me to see the Lord in a much more clear way. But they were an instructing couple. The last thing, all these things really accumulate to this last one. Go in your Bible to Romans chapter 16. We're going to see that they were an investing couple. An investing couple. What I mean by that is they got involved. Romans chapter 16. Let's look at verse 3. This is another part where we find them. Verses 3, 4, and 5. Paul, at the end of his 
letter to the Romans, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. A little bit of the same thing we hear, we, we hear from Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. He says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. There are a couple things I want to notice, and uh, some of it may be a little bit of a speculation. But some things that I think are necessary here in the, in the way that they invested and I think that God desires that we would invest in others. Romans 16, 3, it said that they laid down their own necks. He referred to them as their, his helper. That word helper is a fellow helper or co-laborer. They had come alongside Paul. They were involved with Paul. Uh, they're in Ephesus. When Paul writes to Timothy, they had come alongside Timothy. And they also had these churches in the Corinth and the other location in their house. They were investing in people. They were use, letting God use them to work in the lives of other people. Now think of how, some, just a couple ways about how God does that, or desires to do that in our life. First way is I believe that we can invest through our hospitality. You know, these churches were in their house. I believe that they were hospitable. They were letting God use what they had for his work. Romans chapter 12 and verse 13, distributing to the necess uh, necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. That's something that's not written to just pastors. That's given to all of us as believers. We're to be given to hospitality. Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Hebrews 13.2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, those who were passing through or of this same idea, the itinerant type of people. Uh, Peter exhorted the same thing in 1 Peter 4.9, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hospitable people. It's one way that we can be investing. Also, there's another way, and that is through honesty. Now, honesty is found to be the same Greek word used for gravity. And we find that we're to live our lives in all godliness and honesty. All godliness and honesty. First Timothy 2.2 2 tells us that. And the, so thinking about different ways that we could allow God to work through us, without honesty, you can't invest in people. They won't let you invest in them. See what I'm saying? I, if I am deceitful, why would you trust me? If I'm not an honest person, and I, that, hey, that applies to a lot of things. Not paying our bills, not uh, telling the truth completely, or being deceptive about it. You know, our children watch us, especially dads, and they see if we're honest or if we're deceptive. My whole family on my dad's side, very deceptive people. That's how I grew up. You're confronted about something, you don't have to be honest with it. You can excuse it. You can justify it. There's a way to get out of it. My dad got pulled over by a police officer. My little brother was in the passenger seat. No, I'm not trying to bash my dad here. This is just an example of how easy it is to not be honest. He got pulled over by our local Barney Fife in southeast Minnesota. <laughs> He's a young guy just out of the thing. Anyway, he'd, he'd pass my dad in the oncoming lane. He'd say, hey, you didn't have your seatbelt on. That's an automatic $50 fine in Minnesota. And my dad, when he got pulled over, had reached over and put his seatbelt on. Yeah, you reach over this way, put your seatbelt on. My little brother sitting there watching that whole thing. 
And the officer had come to the window, said, I pulled you over because, not because you were speeding, but you didn't have your seatbelt on. And my dad says, I, I have my seatbelt on. And he didn't deny that he hadn't, but he kept pointing out that he does now. A little brother shared that when, we got, when they got home to the rest of the family. Dad lied to a police officer. He knew what it was. Maybe eight or nine at the time, but he knew what it was. Isn't that how we treat sin sometimes in our life? We justify it, but who's watching us? Not just the people we're trying to minister to, but our children. If I lose my kids, I have no ministry. You know, that would be the worst thing. How can I ever tell you how to raise your family? If my family's a wreck. And anyway, without honesty, folks, we can't invest in other people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 7. You should do that which is honest. Philippians 4, 8. We're to think on whatsoever things are honest. 1 Peter 2, 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, even those who are without Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21. We're to provide for honest things. Romans 12, 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. 1 Thessalonians 4, 12. Walk honestly toward them that are without. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Boy, that's a good principle right there in a lot of areas of life. But they were honest. They were hospitable. The last thing I'd like us to look at is in their investing, I believe that they were happy. They were happy people. Why would people want to come to my church if I was a sourpuss? Why would people want to come to my, my church if I looked like I'd been sucking on a lemon all morning. Really. You, just, you know, imagine in your mind walking into a church as a visitor and everybody in there just... <laughs> you, know, you have to go introduce yourself to them. And they're... How's your morning? Oh, that's the wrong question. Because they're going to give you the whole spiel. And I'm guilty of that. I've done this. And I've even done it recently. But <laughs> God's people should be a happy people. We've done a good job separating joy and happiness. But you know, <laughs> happiness, I believe, is a result of joy. That even in, I, I've seen so many people go through rough, tough things that the Lord's led them through. And they still are happy. You know that they're not feeling well but they're happy. You know that there was just something ca catastrophic that took place in their family, but they are happy. How God's people, I mean, I know how we do it. We <laughs> take our eyes off the Lord and we begin looking at the boisterous sea around us, as Peter did. But how is God's people, do you think that we can ever invest in somebody else if there's not something that they see in us that they want? that they feel a, even an ounce of, of, of interest in. You know, you need to trust the Lord as your Savior. and You need to live for Him. And blah, 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 you know, we share the gospel with them. But then they see me all the rest of the time that they're around me complaining about the boss and, their, and I've got all these problems that I'm sharing with them and I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm describing my life. Is there something there that you think they want? My brother-in-law, Nate Townsend, he worked uh, with us for a short period of time in between some semesters. And he was working with my supervisor one day. And this, this I thought was so neat. Nate had a, just a different perspective of a lot of things. You know, a lot of you know Nate, right? Nate's, Nate's, Nate's a sweet guy. A lot of things about Nate... It, because he's not here, I would be, love to share with you. <laughs> but he tells me all about you, so anyway. We'll take another office. <laughs> all right. He told me he might come tomorrow, so I'm, I'll be good. No, no I, I appreciate Nate. The Lord's done a lot of work in his heart. And even over the past years, 
uh, I don't know how to say it. He's got a good head on his shoulders. He's looking toward the Lord in a lot of ways. You start talking about something, he wants to talk about the Bible. And when this, uh, I hope the Lord calls him to the ministry. I know he's got some desires, and I hope the Lord uses him that way. But there's a, this young man was working alongside Nate, and he said, oh, man, he's a great storyteller, this fellow was. He's hilarious. Time would go by so quickly. And when you're bored doing the same monotonous job, that was really nice. Nate interrupted his story, and he said, Mark, what's the purpose of your life? <laughs> you know, for the next seven or eight years that I worked with that fellow, Mark, whenever he thought of Nate, that question came back. Why? Because there was something about Nate there. And Nate gave him the gospel, but that question haunted him. What is the purpose of my life? To have that nice truck that's jacked up and big tires, and I got the best gun, and I got the newest compound bow money can buy, $1,200. I've got the best four-wheeler, I've got a new house, I've got this, prime real estate. You know, those are all things he was consumed with. And then that question, is your life focused on investing in other people? That takes time. It takes a desire to not think about what they're going to think of you, but that you want to see God as my judge. We'll look at this later. This thought that God is my judge, not man. I'm responsible to serve him because he's the one I, I, I answer to. But boy, you know, that, that thought of investing in other people through our hospitality, not just having them over for a meal, but using whatever God has given to me to help somebody else to work out my Christianity, I guess, a better way to say that, but to show them that I care, to show them that I see a need and I want to help them with that need. Also, through my honesty, my godliness, we could also say my holiness, my personal holiness. People see that as well. But our happiness. 1 Peter 1.8. You rejoice with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. Philippians 4.4, 4, several references in Philippians we could look at. But we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians 1.10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. That was Paul's testimony. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice evermore. Are you a happy person tonight? You say what? You've gone 10 minutes longer than you should have. And no, I'm not. <laughs> I understand and I apologize. But, you know, I can rejoice because my name's written in heaven. I can rejoice because I know that all things work together for good to them that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. The things that God allows into my life, I can rejoice. I don't see the end of them. I don't understand why, but I can be happy because I know God is at work doing something. This whole thing with my father-in-law right now, that's been my life for a month, five weeks. But you know something that uh, the Lord has taught is that we are just to wait upon the Lord. It's those who wait on the Lord that he gives strength to. And that's something that I've been, uh, Mrs. Bickford actually sent us that verse one day. She said, my verse for you and your mom, Janie, is Isaiah 40, 31 and a couple other verses out of Isaiah. I read that, and, you know, the Lord really impressed that on my heart. And so many other verses everywhere I'm reading in the Psalms is that just wait on me. Allow me to do what I am trying to do. Let me be God. Just wait on me. Just wait. It's, I love the things that God is doing through this. But I want to challenge you tonight to let the examples of Aquila and Priscilla help you to live a life in such a way that you are going to impact the cause of Christ. Let me rephrase it. Let their character, let these things that we've looked at, their industrious attitude, hardworking spirit, their not being tied down to any location, but being... Itinerant, letting God move them wherever he desired because they wanted to be a blessing.
But then uh, their instruction, being instructed in person, that ought to be all of us. As we learn about God, we need to be instructing other people. But then also being involved, being investing, letting God change lives. But I believe that if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives in these areas, we could make a difference in a great way. We may never be known as great people. Nobody might know our name, but we could impact people for all of eternity. Let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for this group of men. Thank you for their attention. Thank you for bringing us all here tonight. Thank you for Aquila and Priscilla, these folks that were faithful, and I'm sure they had struggles of life. There were things that they had to learn as well, to walk by faith. I'm thankful that you recorded these things about them, that they can encourage us, point us in a direction. Father, I ask that you'd use us and help us to be faithful in your name. Amen.